That is the sound of your beating heart, and this is episode 151 of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney, and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. I hope you had a good Valentine's Day. That was the day we celebrate other people's heart. February has been known from the American Heart Association as Heart Month or Go Red Month. As a cardiologist, I think every month is heart month, and I think your heart is special that you should celebrate it every month of the year. So welcome uh, to the podcast. Uh, Like I said, I am a cardiologist. Uh, I'm also a primary care physician and endurance athlete. And uh, what's been going on Um, as far as the training aspects of things, uh, getting ready for the Asheville Half and Whole Marathon next month. So that's uh, coming along. Back to swimming in the pool. It's warmed up here in uh, Florida. Uh, so that uh, uh, this runner in me is not afraid to get in the, the the water at 60 degrees in the morning. I know everybody feels sorry for me, but it's just the way it is. So swimming is coming back. I swim two days a week, and I run the other days. Um, run with two German Shepherds in the mornings, and then uh, takes take another loop without them if uh, I want to go longer. They're they're run about six miles um, during these temperatures in Florida. When it gets a little hotter, they, they run a little less because it's a little little tough even in the early morning hours, um, and I don't want uh, to get their feet in the concrete and all that other kind of stuff for the heat, but they do a really good job, um, they're, and they're a great company to run with, and, and they're good motivators too because I know that they want to run, uh, and, they're, and they're ready to go in the morning, so it's, uh, it's an easy uh, way for me to get out the door because I, I know that they want to go so bad. Um, continue to do a little weight training, a little yoga, a little stretching, um, and uh, to try to get ready for those hills of Asheville uh, since we're living here in Florida. But, yeah, it's going okay. Um, the backyard garden is going fabulous. Um, the tower garden and tomatoes are, are and kale and lettuce are, are doing uh, really, really good. I hope to have tomatoes soon. There are little green ones hanging everywhere. We also have some green tomatoes in our raised beds and some peppers. And um, the funny thing, we, we threw our compost out into our um, raised bed, and now we're getting all kind of mystery vegetables coming up, so we'll see how they do. Mango trees are in full bloom. Uh, we had a little bit of a frost, and I was afraid we lost a lot of trees, but everything's coming back and greening up and getting new leaves. So we're excited that uh, we're probably going to have mangoes and avocados this year. So. Um, and uh, lemon trees too. So that should be a good year for fruit here in uh, uh, Port Charlotte. Uh, Dr. Barnard was down in our area um, to an event in Fort Myers, and, and we went down and heard him talk about his new uh, book about uh, the cheese addiction. Then we promptly went to an Italian restaurant and, and had to fight off cheese from everything. But we did manage to get a salad without cheese and a pizza without cheese, so it was a good evening. We're gearing up uh, for our third annual Charlotte County Plant-Based Nutrition Conference. It starts on March 23rd with private, private consultations with myself and Addie, as well as yoga se- sessions. Um, Tim Marie Hagenberger will also be available for uh, private nutrition consults. So uh, get your tickets for those. Um, and then on March 24th, is our day-long lecture. Doug Lai will be our featured speaker uh, from True North Health. Uh, he'll speak about the pleasure trap. And so if you haven't heard him, he a, gives a, a great talk. Uh, he'll be available for the day for questions and answers. Um, I'll be speaking as well as Addie uh, Delaney Minard, my registered dietitian, and Timory Hagenberger. And we'll have cooking demonstrations. It'll be a, a fabulous plant-based breakfast and lunch. So I hope you all come and, and join us. Uh, it's a great day to sit around and uh, be motivated by people around you, meet new plant-based people. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people complain that they, they they live in isolation because they don't have anybody supporting them. And conferences like this that are day-long are great uh, avenues to meet people um, and socialize and be in a room where you're not judged and there's no vegan police and uh, everything is great. So. Uh, check it out on the website, drdelaney.com, uh, where you can uh, get more information about the conference and, and get your tickets right there uh, with a link to Eventbrite. So I hope to see you there. Um, again, get your tickets soon. They are running out. Um, we we um, have to kind of cut it off here in the first part of March um, so we can get a head count for the chefs because we want everything fresh and organic and uh, want to make it a very, very special day for everybody. This was the first full week in our new nutrition 
education kitchen in my office. Uh, it was fabulous not to have to drag coolers to an offsite location and have the cleanup and everything. Uh, it was just it's just great being in the room. We're able to video um, the cooking demo, demos so that we can put them up on our private membership page. And uh, we're putting the audio up as well of the lectures. And it just makes it so much easier since we don't have to drag everything everywhere we go. Um, because it was Valentine's week, um, it was chocolate mousse week in our um, kitchen, test kitchen. So we made chocolate mousse for all three classes um, with black beans and cacao powder. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, and a few other ingredients. Um, but uh, uh, it, it was great. We served them with fresh strawberries and fresh mint from my backyard. So... Uh, that was fun to have, uh, usually the last class of our six week sessions, our dessert night, kind of, we kind of call them graduation, uh, classes. And we, uh, sum up what, what's been learned in each of the classes. We have a beginning class, um, that learn about the basic science, uh, supporting plant-based nutrition. And then we progress from there with a level two class, um, that is, uh, more leeway to discuss troubleshoot and more science. And then, um, the third class we do, uh, the latest and the greatest news in the plant-based nutrition world, as well as more advanced cooking techniques. So, um, uh, a lot of fun is had, and like I said, this, the sixth the six class, we kind of sum it all up and uh, see what everybody knows and retains and goes over things and, and troubleshoots because half the problem is when, you know, you feel really comfortable talking uh, and listening about plant-based nutrition, and then you go out to dinner with somebody and they ask you a question and it throws you for a loop. One, you're not prepared, perhaps. Um, you know, you didn't see it coming, and, and uh, the kit catch you off guard, and, and two, you might just not have a complete idea you you know when you heard it that it was um this is something really good for you but you're not quite sure of the why and the how and the science and i tell people in the class you know it, it helps to hear it more than one time and more than one way because it kind of reinforces the the whys and you and you have unfortunately you have to have a little bit of a defense uh because they're ready to tell you sometimes when you're you know you get in these situations see i told you it didn't work and see there i told you there was no science behind it um and uh, so it's nice to have, if you just have a couple sentences or a couple little go-tos that you can, you know, at least make the um, interrogation stop or, you know, at least give people room for pause uh, so that they don't keep, keep at you. So that's what we kind of try to do uh, on the last class to make sure everybody's ready to go out in the world and um, tell everybody what they know and share information in a positive way. You know, I don't mean to say that, you know, you need to have a, a full on debate and win the debate every time. And I often tell the students, um, just give people what they need to know. Um, if people want to know, they'll keep asking questions. You know, we don't need to, you know, you don't go in with anything else and tell everybody everything you know about a certain subject. So if they ask a question, give an answer and, uh, keep it fairly simple and short, and if they want to know more, they'll ask more. And I think that's it's probably the best way around it because if you're plant-based and, and you look good and you look fit uh, and you look healthy, and, you know, they, they'll, that's going to start the dialogue. And then you can say, you know, I dropped my cholesterol being plant-based and leave it at that. So since it is the week of Valentine's Day and it is February and Heart Month, I, I thought we would dedicate this episode to... Um, all of our hearts, um, because it is your most precious, precious organ. And sometimes, uh, most of the time, we spend taking care of other people's hearts, whether it be emotionally or, or them physically, and we neglect our hearts and maybe don't even realize we have one until something happens. Um, my first introduction into the heart was the story of my grandfather, um, they called him Gino, but his uh, is a name when he his name when he came from Italy at age twelve was Idamo, and Idamo came to this country and began working very hard. Um, it was a coal miner. He smoked. Um, he had about an eighth grade education, um, but he always stressed to his family that he wanted them to go to college. And unfortunately, he died at forty eight of a massive heart attack. Um, he left my grandmother. Uh, with a 12-year-old at home, and um, they had a, uh, a business, and she ran the business and was raising uh, 
you know, her son, she had two, three older children. Um, she didn't take care of herself either. She became obese, diabetic, uh, and she actually died at 56 of heart failure as a complication to diabetes. And I do remember her. Um, I was about eight or nine when she died, but I remembered going to get her and taking her to the hospital when she couldn't breathe or when she was in a diabetic coma. Um, and I would sit in the back seat and I could hear her breathe. And, you know, we would go in, they would put me in the waiting room and they would talk about heart failure and being in an oxygen tent. And, uh, you know, I never, um, you know, at that time kids never went into a room, but I saw her before she went into the emergency room and, you know, my curiosity uh, about what this heart problem was started just then and there. My other grandmother had diabetes uh, from age, you know, in her 50s. Uh, and one year after Christmas um, was just what we call overwhelmingly fatigued. Uh, she thought she had the flu. I can still remember the symptoms. If she, she would say things like, if I could just belch, I would feel better. Um, just was very uncomfortable, couldn't settle down. Um, the local GP actually came to the house, thought she had the flu, things got worse. She went to the hospital and she had a massive heart attack and died. So that was, um, you know, a devastating blow. She, uh, I had stayed with her most of the time while my parents worked and it was pretty much then and there, um, along with, I had some good science teachers that really, um, I knew that's what I wanted to do at a very early age was to be a heart doctor. Um, I went to medical school and there was a couple times where I wasn't sure if, you know, I was going to be a heart doctor or not, but I always came back to it and it, it always made such good sense to me, you know, the, the physiology of a heart and, and the, in the plumbing of, of the heart and it, um, it, it just something that, you know, you kind of, kind of, um, it, well, it made sense to me more than any other field. Fast forward, um, through medical school and into my residency and now into cardiology fellowship, um, we, uh, I, I did my fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh, and it was a big transplant center. And I remember waiting, uh, or, or being around patients waiting for a heart, um, and the anxiety about, you know, uh, they'd often be on medications for months, sometimes years, um, intravenously in the hospital back in those days, waiting for a heart. And when they got the heart, it wasn't over then because. That meant that they had to have heart catheterizations to check the heart for a rejection, um, you know, a couple times a week at that time, and then once a week, and then every couple of weeks, and every three weeks, and every month, and every six months, and then finally once a year. And they took these massive anti-rejection uh, drugs. And so it certainly wasn't over for them, you know. I mean, I, I always, you know, came back to the original equipment. Our original heart is the best one we'll ever get. And even though they got this gift of life, um, there was such anxiety associated with if, you know, is a rejection and coming in for the heart catheterizations and, and coming in to get it monitored. Um, and if there was a rejection, you know, and all the trauma they had been through waiting for a heart. Um, and it, it really was, it was difficult for these people. And I, and I, you know, again, I, I would always come back to the original equipment is, is the, the best equipment we'll ever get. Our original heart is the best heart that we'll ever have an opportunity to have. Uh, and, and we have to take care of it. And during my pediatric rotation, pediatric cardiology rotation, I remember, you know, seeing kids again with heart surgery for, um, you know, congenital heart defects and the way the heart is formed, it has so many twists and turns on itself during the, you know, the, the gestation that it, it's hard to believe that any heart turns out to, you know, like it should be, uh, because there's so many places where it's truly a miracle. There's so many places where things could go wrong. And it was also a miracle that the surgeons, how they could actually, you know, take it apart and put it back together, uh, so that it functioned better and these, these children could live and they, and they did well. Uh, but it, again, such a miracle, you know, that, you know, at 21 days, you have a little walnut that's beating and it has to twist and turn on itself, uh, and share blood with the mother. And then it actually works. It, it's a truly a special organ, um, and the basis for, you know, our life. And as soon as we're born and the doctor says the, the heart is okay, we forget about it. It beats and it beats and it beats and it beats about 86,000 over 86,000 times a day, and, and we ignore it. 
um, as long as it's working, we, you know, it, we don't take it to the car. We don't get an oil change. We, uh, don't rotate its tires. Uh, uh, we just let it beat and don't ever think about what we need to do to keep it pristine. So how do you take care of your heart and what can go wrong with your heart? And, um, so let's, let's take a little, a little, um, look at science for a second, um, First of all, the coronary arteries, um, I like to describe as strings on top of a football. So if your heart's more shaped like a, a football, um, it's long and oblong, and the coronary arteries sit on top, and they actually nourish the heart with blood. So your heart actually has to pump the blood out of it into the aorta, where the first vessels that come off of your aorta are the coronary arteries. And so it pumps, and the blood goes to feed itself first. Um, you know, you can use that as a metaphor. You need to take care of yourself first before you can take care of others. But anyway, we supply uh, our, our own blood flow to our heart, and it provides oxygen and nutrients. And then the blood continues up the aorta and to the rest of the body with freshly oxygenate, oxygenated blood. So if you have vascular disease, um, starting with high blood pressure, the cells, that single cell lining, the endothelial cell that you've all heard Dr. Esselstyn talk about, as well as I've talked about, it becomes abnormal, uh, it becomes lumpy and bumpy. Uh, it becomes like a road that has potholes in it. Um, it becomes like a drain that has sub soaps, so, um, soap scum in it. And the blood can't get to where it's going easily. And so the heart has to put more pressure out or generate more pressure to push the blood through these abnormal blood vessels. And when the, that endothelial cell layer becomes dysfunctional, it no longer secretes the nitric oxide to help it dilate when it needs to be. So, and, and one of the functions of those arteries dilating is so we can get more blood quicker downstream. So if you were to go for a run, you wanna get more blood flow to your legs. If you were to eat dinner, you want more blood flow to your heart. The blood vessels have to dilate appropriately in the appropriate areas to get the blood flow to where it's going. If that can't happen, again, the heart has to put out a lot more pressure, to gen generates a lot more pressure in and of itself to get the blood where it's going. So that in turn backs up and causes that heart muscle to get thickened. Not unlike your bicep when you're working it, working it, working it, it actually gains, you, you, your, the muscle cells grow and thicken, so does the heart muscle cell. Well, the problem with the heart muscle cell becoming very thick is that it's harder for those blood vessels that sit on top of the heart to actually feed it nutrients. So not only do the arteries sit on top of the heart, but then they send little branches, like little roots, down into the heart muscle to get the nutrients to where they need to go. So if that heart muscle is very thick, it's harder to get the nutrients because they have to go further in um, because the muscle's thick. It also is those little vessels are becoming squeezed. So now the heart has to generate more pressure just to get oxygen and nutrients to itself. So again, we're working, you know, as time goes on, we're working harder and harder to get these, you know, this blood flow to where it's going. This didn't start at 50 or 55 or 60, it started at 30. Um, you know, again, when you look um, around you at either the soccer field or a baseball stadium and you see people in their 30s and 40s, you, the, if you look at the start of a 5K or a marathon, there are a lot of people there with vascular disease and they don't even know it because they feel okay. You can't feel those blockages of 20, 30, 40%. You can't feel that heart muscle because it's like the best, you know, the best, I, I love German Shepherd dogs. It's like the most loyal organ of our body that it's gonna pump its hardest to try to get blood flow wherever we want it without us knowing it until it gets to the point where it's starting to fail. That vascular disease and that endothelial layer abnormality doesn't just happen in the peripheral arteries going to your legs and your stomach and to your other organs. It actually happens in the coronary arteries. And typically, uh, if you think about a stream and debris coming down a stream, it gets stuck where there's a bend, um, where there's a fork in the road. That's, that's where the, the tree branches start to get stuck. The next thing that happens is the muscle downstream doesn't get enough oxygen and that's when chest pain starts or a chest tightness. The other thing that people fail to look at, you know, when you gain some weight, people's like, oh, I'm out of shape, I need to get back into shape. 
but it's really hard on your heart to be overweight because adipose tissue is very vascular. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of blood supply. If you've ever had any surgeries uh, or cut yourself in some place that you're carrying extra weight, um, there's a tremendous amount of bleeding. So your heart actually has to pump blood to every cell that you have and, and you know, to the most distal aspects of your whole body. So carrying around extra weight means that you have a lot more blood, little blood vessel channels that have grown in, um, and you're, you're having to supply those areas with blood. Again, it puts more stress on your heart. People don't realize it, but when you're overweight, you also carry more muscle because you have to move that mass around. And so, again, you have more blood, vo blood vessels to the muscles, more vascular supply. And, again, that also causes a strain on the heart. Now, in, now add in nutrition. So we have a body that's bigger than it should be uh, with blood vessels that aren't pristine and clean. And so our heart is pumping. And then we go ahead and take in a meal that has a bunch of oil or fat in it. And then we have this constriction of the arteries uh, and this inflammation that we have to clear. So it again adds more stress onto the heart. And, and the reality of it is that's why more, more heart, heart attacks occur uh, in the night and the wee hours because your, your body's trying to metabolize all that you've taken in the day and the night before. And it's, your heart is working so hard to clear and, and move blood flow through these arteries that are constricted down. Uh, and when we eat salty food, you retain water so you have more volume for your heart to, to um to move around and when you're up on your feet during the day that volume and gravity it pushes out into your ankles and people's feet swell and their legs swell and they and their hands swell and, and they actually have more blood in uh in more fluid in their tissues because of gravity everywhere and when you lay down at night you start to resorb all that water and in, into back into the bloodstream and again, now the heart has to pump all that around, and that's where the stress of the heart at night becomes such a difficult problem. And people, uh, you'll hear things that people wake up and they can't, they can't lay down because they can't breathe or they have to sit on the side of the bed. That's a sign of heart failure. So the first warning light to come on for your heart is a blood pressure issue. When your blood pressure starts to go up, you know that you're um, adding extra work on your heart. Um, the next thing, obviously, when your weight goes up, you know you're adding stress onto your heart. Um, people don't see that as an indicator. It's more of a yellow light than the big red light um, that, that, you know, that something is dreadfully going wrong. And then people start to have the symptoms. So when they exert themselves, they get shorter breath. Or again, they note swelling uh, in their feet or their ankles or bloating uh, in, in their, you know, their clothes are too tight. And then the next thing that happens is usually fatigue because, again, your, your heart's not getting the, the oxygen to your, your tissues and to your brain. So this is overwhelming fatigue type of, of situation. More tired when you do less. And then there's a shortness of breath when you do things. And there can be a chest pressure when you do things. And then it goes away when you rest because what happens is that when you exert yourself, your coronary arteries, your heart demands more blood and, you're, and it can't get there. Uh, and so you get chest discomfort. It's your warning light to stop and slow down, and then the discomfort goes away. These are all lights that nobody pays attention to until it gets somebody that become very diaphoretic and short of breath, and, and, you know, and, and then that could be an actually an acute heart attack, and then they present to the emergency room. So you don't want to let it, to, you obviously don't want to let it get there and get that far. But the, the scary part about it is that it doesn't necessarily progress you know, uh, a little shorter breath, a little fatigue, a little bit of jaw discomfort because your jaws, uh, the, the, some of the nerves are similar. So you can get jaw pain as an anginal or a chest pain equivalent. It doesn't have to necessarily happen in a gradual progression. It can be all at once. A, blo a blockage in the arteries in the heart can go from 20% one day to 100% the next day uh, in a matter of hours. If a plaque, and what, and what typically happens is that plaque or that blockage ruptures. Cholesterol is like little crystals that are very, very sharp and can actually puncture the top of that plaque and then a blood clot forms and that's when a heart attack occurs. So just saying that, well, I don't have chest pain now and everything's great um, is not necessarily 
Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not an accurate statement. Um, so, you know, when people come into the office with, you know, with a spouse and they say, well, it's okay for them to be on the diet because they have problems, but I don't have problems. They don't know if they have problems or not. And typically when I look at them, I can see the problems. I can see that they're overweight. I can see that their legs are swollen. I can see that they're breathing abnormally. Um, but just because they haven't uh, had a doctor diagnose it, they assume that they're perfectly healthy. Um, I, I, I heard an interview with a guy and he's like, people just need to look in the mirror. Um, because if you look in the mirror, you can say, Hey, you know, do I look okay? It's, it's not take a really good look in the mirror to see whether or not you're carrying extra weight. Are your legs swollen? You know, what's your color look like? Does it look like that, uh, brown piece of meat that you had last night? You know, um, so, you know, look in the mirror and you can see, see a lot of things. So how do we go about fixing it uh, once it's broken? Um, you know, if it's the big one uh, where that you have chest discomfort at rest and you're sweaty and you're sick at your stomach, you need to call 911. That needs to be fixed mechanically. Um, all other cases have not been shown to um, respond any better to intervention than, than medical therapy. So the medical therapy, certainly we can give you medicines to make the arteries dilate a little bit, make the blood pressure come down, uh, make the cholesterol come down, and that settles things down, but it doesn't change what you continue, can continue to do to your body if you're eating the standard American diet. So it's, you know, it's back to our, our nutrition. Uh, it's back to whole food, plant-based nutrition. Um, right up front, get those five greens, cups of greens in a day. The kale, Swiss chard, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, mustard greens, all of those, spinach, get those in, any kind of cabbage. Um, I just came back from my run. I just ran 16 miles, and I have a tower garden. And the first thing I do is, uh, uh, well, my run is usually six miles with my dogs, and then I come back, and uh, they take a little break, and I get some nutrition, and I go back out. I came in after the 15. We went back outside to play a little Frisbee, and I get to my tower garden, and I actually had my salad right there, uh, picking my greens right off the tower garden. I had kale and uh, lettuce, and, you know, I just had my little smorgasbord. Uh, before I came in to get my fruit. So uh, get your five cups of greens a day any way you can and, and dose them in, you know, dose them in every four to five hours because they don't last. You digest them and it goes away. So now that you've got your greens in, um, you got to eliminate the animal protein and the animal fat. So, and, and the cooking oils, just because you got the greens in doesn't mean it's a go to, to go ahead and put all that other inflammatory, um, producing chemicals and, um, substances into your body. So, you know, work on getting the animal protein and the fat and the, um, you know, the processed oils out of your system. Get your body back in shape. Um, oftentimes I see people try to run off their, their weight or exercise off their weight. And so they do a body camp or a boot camp and, or they start running right out of the bat. And of course it doesn't last very long. They start to get ankle injuries, tendon injuries, throw their back out because your body's not used to it. And you're having to carry a lot more weight. Plus you're straining your heart a lot more. All of a sudden your heart's having trouble getting blood to where it needs to already. And now you're going to make it pump harder to try to get to the rest to, you know, um, to try to, you know, burn this, this, this fat off your body. And, and force yourself to be in shape. So it's not taking care of your body, and it's certainly not taking care of your heart. So, you know, start out slow. Um, you, didn't, you know, uh, you, you, you may have went years without exercising. You can't go to full speed ahead uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, when I see people sign up for the marathons, you know it's one and done. And they sign up, and they drag themselves through a half marathon or some sort of race to say they completed it, but they feel awful afterwards. And... Um, you need to you need to start out you know start out slow listen to your body if it's hurting you need to back off walking won't hurt anybody it's going to hurt a little bit you know your joints aren't used to it but you know most of your training should be done at a conversational pace if you're huffing and puffing you're working too hard out, out of the gate so you know work your way up you know 10 percent rule increase your activity about 10 percent a week uh, and, and again, pay attention and, and your body needs rest and your heart needs rest and your body needs rest without having to metabolize a bunch of food before you go to bed. Um, people are afraid that, uh, you know, they're not going to have enough calories or their sugar is going to drop. Uh, don't eat before you go to bed. Let your body rest. Have some, you know, have some downtime. Try to close the kitchen after dinner. Um, both, um, you know, um, 
always, you know, mentally as well as physically. Don't, you know, don't go back in there. You know, shut it down so your body can rest. Um, the other thing is a stress re- stress reliever. When we have stress, we generate all kinds of things that cause our bloody body, our blood vessels to constrict, our heart rate to go up, and it's stress on our heart. So, you know, think about some meditation. Uh, again, walking without uh, anything, just listening, and, and it's a great way to solve problems, just to go out for a walk. Um, Oh, and, and learn to sit and meditate and learn to sit and just be quiet. We are so addicted to our social media devices that we have to look at them every second. You know, try to just stand and, you know, or just sit for a little bit without looking at, at social media. You know, there's lots of songs about, about the heart and breaking, you know, having a broken heart. Uh, people refer to people as uh, he had a big heart um, or she was, you know, she had a good heart. Um, he was all heart. Um, don't break my heart. And um, I would like you to focus this month and the rest of 2018 and, and forevermore on taking care of your heart. And don't ignore, don't ignore your heart. You might not be able to hear it beat. Some people can. Uh, but, but take it for granted. Maybe get a little stethoscope and, and, and listen to it beat once in a while. And, um, you know, pay a little extra attention to what you can do to keep the most important organ in your body in pristine shape. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing organ. Um, it's the first thing that starts to beat. And it's the last thing. That, that's the, the last thing to go. Um, so really do try to take care of it because the original equipment is the best equipment. And once you start repairing it with, uh, little pieces of metal here and there and, and, uh, drugs that change the way your body and your heart beats, um, it's, it's never quite the same. So, you know, really take good care of your heart. Um, I can't, you know, and if you take, if you do all the steps that, t- that you need to do to take care of your heart, the rest of your body will be in, in good shape as well. So, um, I hope that, you know, yeah, you pay a little attention and, um, I also hope that you check out the website to drdelaney.com. It's D O C T O L. I'm sorry, T O C T O R D U L A N E Y. Um, we have a nice little video up there about our third annual Charlotte County plant-based nutrition conference. Dr. Doug Lyle from True North is going to be speaking on the pleasure trap. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Timory Hagenberger, who's a registered dietitian from uh, Consume, uh, I'm sorry, Consumness uh, College in Sacramento, uh, will be speaking on brain health. Addie will be Addie Delaney Minerich will be speaking on omega-3 fatty acids. I'll be speaking on the gut microbe. Um, and how it relates to various other organs. We'll have a cooking demonstration. Um, you have a wonderful breakfast and lunch. We've met with the chef. We have the menu planned. Uh, it's just going to be a great day. It's a great facility. Um, if you're out of town, come in early because the day before we can meet. Uh, I'm doing private consultations. Um, uh, there's a few left with me. Um, there's a few left with Addie and Tim Marie. So get those before they're gone. We're also doing two uh, yoga sections, um, a chair yoga and a gentle yoga. So, uh, you know, sign up for those the day before. There's plenty of doing to do in this area today. It is, you know, in the eighties, there's not a cloud in the sky. It's just a beautiful time of year here in Florida. So come down and, and join us. Uh, it's the best time of year here in Florida. You know, if you wait until June, you have to deal with a little humidity, but right now we still have cool nights and, um, cooler mornings, but the sun comes out very early and it, it's just a, a great place to be. You know, look at our website also for our programs. You don't have to be in Port Charlotte or Punta Gorda to be a member of our practice. Um, there's a lot of things we can do, uh, by Skype and telephone. Um, and the website that we have developed for our members is becoming more and more extensive. We're doing videos of the cooking demonstrations on a weekly basis, audios of the presentations, um, and other slide, uh, presentations are there. Um, we're, we're doing two newsletters a month now with recipes and, um, information on, you know, the science and what's happening in, in plant-based nutrition. So there's a lot of, a lot of information there. Um, Addie's available to speak to you, uh, my registered dietitian. Um, 
on all the programs. So you can do um, consultations just with Addy. Uh, you can do consultations with Addy and have access to all our website material as well as a private website or a private Facebook page. Um, you can do an online level two program where we both speak to you on a monthly basis and you have unlimited email and access to us as well as the information online. And then um, we have our full membership where um, you have 24 hour access to uh, me uh, for all your health care needs. Uh, we review um, all of your medicines and I, and I can direct your health care from afar. Um, you may need to see somebody, but, you know, we can know each other very well and support you on getting off, getting you off of your medications. And, and that's, you know, the most important part is to be able to help you to become healthy and to move in a safe way and to get off your medications in a safe way. Um, some of these medications can't be just cold turkeyed off of. Um, so it really needs somebody that's, um, you know, that's familiar with the interactions of medication so that we can back these things off safely. And I can't say enough about having support, you know, especially if you're in a situation where, um, your family's not quite on board. Uh, this is a great way to, you know, have a, a social network of support um, at, in your journey of becoming plant-based. And as you become plant-based and become the lighthouse for your family, then they'll come on. Because you have to remember that they have access to all this website material when you come on. So they'll start to see it and it'll start to, to drift in. And, uh, you know, the more you see it and the more you hear it uh, and the more different ways that you can um, see just how great plant-based nutrition is for uh, achieving optimal health and wellness, um, the better. Um, it's nice to see the Olympics. We have some vegan athletes um, and that, you know, people are eating better and uh, it's just more and more places. Uh, more professional athletes are becoming plant-based and, you um, it's, it's just a, a, it's just very fun to be a part of a movement that is growing so fast that allows us to take back our health and, and wellness and uh, to be able to enjoy life, you know, well into you know, your 90s and, and perhaps 100s. Who knows? So on this, I guess, post-Valentine's Day week, but certainly heart month, I wish you and your heart all the best uh, and to be planned strong and to beat strong and to beat regular um, and uh, take good care of your heart. It's the seat of your soul. <laughs>